to their elders past and present. So nice to all actually be in a room, going to an event where there's real humans and it's not two dimensional. I don't know about you guys, but it doesn't seem to be happening still all that much. Um, so today is, we've called it the connect sessions because the idea is that we all connect, learn some things, uh, hear from some really interesting people who can offer you uh, some great insights from their lives and their careers. And also for all of you to get the chance to speak to them, speak to each other. Hopefully you'll walk away today with some new insights, some new connections and some new ideas. Uh, the way we've structured the day is really just that we're going to be running a panel discussion first to get things, get the creative juices flowing, get everyone kind of talking, get into the headspace. Um, we'll have a break. We can have a little lunch break for an hour and then we're going to come back and we've got some more industry people coming to join us and we'll be doing some speed dating sessions. Sounds a little scary. It just means that we put you in small groups and you get the chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with some interesting industry people. So hopefully you can... And the idea is, look, it is a bit quick. You know, it'll probably be like 12 minutes or something in a group and then you'll move on. But it'll give you the chance to meet some people and hopefully then make some connections which you can chat about later as well. Uh, so to start off, we've got um, a lovely panel coming up on the stage in a minute. We've got Monique Matthews, who's just over there. And Monique is from APRA. So she's coordinated this event today alongside with Kelly Lloyd, uh, someone else from APRA AMCOS who unfortunately isn't here with us today. Uh, so Kel, um, Mon will be leading a panel discussion and we've got the amazing artist Hope D joining us on stage with her management team, Ruby and Dom. So um, we'll jump back up on stage after we're finished and let you know about times and things like that, when to come back. If anybody needs a bathroom, I forgot that bit, down the hallway, uh, straight ahead. So please do uh, use those facilities when you need them. There's water and uh, things out there uh, in the kitchen if you need to fill up your water bottles. So, uh, Mon, I'm going to pass over to you guys. So, if we could get Mon and Hope and Ruby and Dom to come up on stage, please. That would be great. Give them a big round of applause. Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Good. It's so nice to be in person, isn't it? Welcome. So happy you all could join us. Um, we're super stoked to have. Actually, no. <laughs> Sorry, no one's actually seen you. <laughs> Dominic Miller, everyone. Okay. Well, <laughs> I did that on purpose. Oh, I'm so excited about. <laughs> um, so yeah, super stoked to have you all here. Very excited to have Summer Room and Hope D here. Um, do you want to do a bit of an introduction about yourselves before we jump into it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hope. Um, I do music. I studied here actually, and um, I'm very. Uh, I'm a bit of a shell today, so please bear with me. But I'm very happy to be here. That's me. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Ruby. I'm one half of Hope's management team. Just slide it up my head. Um, uh, we, Dom and I, have a business called Sunroom. Um, we're in events, management, and pretty much, I don't know, we do a lot of stuff. Um, we're the co-programmers of Big Sound, um, and we also <coughs> work at Q Music until, I think we've got five weeks left. So, so excited. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. I'll go to Dom then. Hi, I'm Dom. Um, I love the Brisbane Broncos. <laughs> Ruby said everything, um, yeah, but that's that's an extra bit about me. Wonderful, thanks. Dr. I just want to say, Hopi said she's a shell, and I want to just I want it because she would never talk about this herself. She was playing in Sydney last night. She plays in Jess Day's band, and she was playing in Sydney last night. She flew home at what six a.m. this morning to be here for this, and she played Melbourne Thursday night, Friday, and one of the hardest working people in the biz. So be real, Hopi. The legend. Um, so today's panel is going to focus mainly on about being an unsigned artist and building your team because building from the ground up can be really, really hard. So firstly, Hope, congratulations on the release of the album. Thank you. Has anyone listened to it yet? Yeah. Clash of the Substance, so good. Which Mon did the artwork for, just as a little side note. Incredible art. <laughs> I really wish you had to say that. <clears throat> 
Um, okay, so we're just going to jump into the first question. So how long did you DIY everything for? Um, quite a while, actually. Like, I think I was out of uni. I Actually, funnily enough, I had a management, like a, a manager kind of, who was um, studying at JMC, and um, she uh, had to do a uni assignment on me. And then from there, she kind of kept on helping me out a bit. But it wasn't like the kind of help that I needed because I kind of knew everything that she was doing and I kind of wanted to do it. Like I didn't feel comfortable letting someone else um, do that for me yet. Um, so I would say about like till 2018, 18, 19, 2019, that's when I got a booking agent. And then um, after that, 2020, I kind of went through a couple of managers, but nothing official. And then 2020, I'm pretty sure, November 2020 is when we are really good with the dates. I have no idea. <laughs> You're like a freak with dates like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're at Bloodhound Bar, and Ruby said yes. <laughs> um, hope you got down on one knee. And yeah. was like, yeah. We could be my band mom. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, for, for about that long, and from there, I was just like recording my own stuff, paying um, a producer. And um, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much 2019. Was there a reason in the beginning you didn't want a manager coming in and kind of handling that, the, those aspects? I actually just, like, wanted to find the right person, I think, for me. And wanted to, like, really get along with them and, like, know that they love my music. I think because it started as a uni assignment, like, the first um, one, um, even though it's just so lovely and it actually was the biggest help for me, I think I was just too overprotective at that time um, and wasn't taking myself as seriously, like, as I wanted to be taking myself. And so when I started taking myself more seriously, that's when I wanted to, like, find a team. Yeah. Awesome. So you, you kind of got to that point where you where you recognised you needed representation. What was there any kind of specific like a show or you know like a like a project an EP coming out that you were like okay I really need to start building a team for this. Yeah, actually I had been recording um, my first EP called Cash Only and I recorded a song called Swim and then um, at the time my like uh, friend slash like manager at the time uh, sent it to some people and then all these people it got a lot of interest and they said that I should like wait on the release and like make it a bit more of a big deal because it was like a special song and then that's kind of when I was like oh so it's not just like a fun little hobby thing like it could actually do well or something and then that's when I wanted to actually have like an official theme. How do you find Sunroom? How do I find them? <laughs> How did I find them? I, I guess oh, it's actually a really funny story. I always knew that Ruby like was a manager um, managing bugs and whatnot. And I think I knew you through like Summer King, who manages Psycho and a bunch of other cool bands. And um, yeah, I just thought that you were really cool and I thought that it would be really awesome to work with another female and um, like, yeah, to have that representation. And so like, I asked Ruby, like I, I, we went out for um, uh, coffee, like asked her out, she said yes. And then we, um, I asked her if she would ever be interested in managing me and it was right before COVID. So then that kind of ruined everything. And then we didn't talk for a really long time. And then I was at my hairdresser and um, who also does Ruby's hair, Dreamboat, excellent place. And um, I was like, oh, how's Ruby and stuff? Like, cause I always asked about you, I just wanted to know how you were. And, um, and then I said to EJ, my hairdresser, um, yeah, I think I really messed things up. Like I really wanted uh, Ruby to man manage me, but now I've got just like other kind of manager and, all this stuff, and then EJ told Ruby the next time he was doing her hair, and was the middleman. And then uh, Ruby's like, "Oh, I'd actually be really interested in managing you now," kind of thing. And yeah, then I texted her in the um, salon chair. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, "We have to meet up." Yeah. And I got the text at work, and I was like, "Oh my god!" It like actually felt like a date it did. for me. Yeah. <laughs> me too. Okay, good. We're actually in love. Yeah, it's, it's the best. But um, yeah, and then that's that's kind of how that happened. So it's actually a really funny, like, story like that. It really is the love story for the ages, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The music industry. Uh, Don on Roofs, um, can you give us a bit of a snapshot about your experience before you took on Cope? Sure. Maybe, maybe like a preview to Sunroom and how Sunroom came about. Yeah, I guess Sunroom's kind of like baby-ish in a way. Um, we used to kind of operate under Domo's moniker of Bluebeard Music, um, which was something that he made up and I was actually his intern for a very long time and then we turned into business partners. Um, I learned how to bully him basically. Um, 
so yeah, we were we were working separately um, as managers, and all of the artists that we've currently got on our roster were like split into either Dom or me. Um, and then we were just like, this is silly. Like, why don't we just, you know, combine Sunroom and be us together? Because we work way better together than we do alone. Everything that I like, he's great at, and it's vice versa. Um, so yeah, um, that's where that came from. And then. I don't remember the rest of the question, so I'm going to throw it to Dom. Well, yeah, I mean, Rubes and I have worked together in um, one capacity or another for almost 10 years. I think it's nine years this year. Um, and, yeah, I first met Rubes when I came. Uh, Rubes was studying at JMC. Um, sorry. Q yeah. <laughs> QUT's like, this is over. Um, we said no mention of other educational institutions. Um, and... I actually was asked to come in and mark uh, some assignments, which I used to do as something that would just pay an invoice every now and again. It was a bit of fun. And Rube's presentation was really great. And I said to her, like, if you were, it was like a business plan, I said, if you wanted to actually do that, it wasn't just an assignment, like, I would be happy to help however I can. And then she needed to do an internship for JMC. And she was like, oh, all right. This guy, can we keep running into each other at gigs? And he keeps being like, seriously, I mean it. Like, Genuinely. If you like, you really ever want to do that. And she was probably like, I don't. And I was like, yeah, but if you do. <laughs> I see Dom do this to other people now. It's <laughs> really hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and she was like, I, I, I'm forced to do an internship, and you're the, you're the. It was either that or write a giant thesis, and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> So then we started working together and, yeah, it was just pretty much from there it was like from day one, Rubes was amazing to work with and then we became very collaborative as we moved on and then we started working for a national agency called New World Artists together um, and we were working together in that. We sort of were working for someone else together and then uh, we both left New World Artists and both went to Q Music to work on Big Sound and... Queensland Music Awards, where we still are today, and we work, we work very collaborative on that. And then, yeah, as Rube says, we sort of hit a point where we went, we're both doing the same work. Um, we love collaborating together. Um, we are like brother and sister in that we love each other very much, but we also like fight like cats and dogs sometimes in a loving way, like in a funny way. Um, but it's a really, we have a really great, like professional relationship in that like I think we we both come up come with ideas that have come from our separate histories I was like I was an artist a touring artist a manager an agent etc and Roots has worked as agency booking venue booker like that kind of thing worked with lots of different artists um and and I think as well for me like it's a I'm a straight white dude and I like I have a very privileged out, outlook on life, whether I like it or not. And it's really great to have Ruby to be able to say, check yourself sometimes or think about it this way, you're not thinking about it. Which I have heard her do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not afraid. <laughs> sometimes I wish you were. Um, <laughs> no, but it's it's like and it's important for me and I think that, you know, it's important for me in the position that I am in and have been in my whole life. It's important for me to surround myself with people who say, hey, that's not, you have, you've had, it's been green lights your entire life, my man. Like, think about how other people, and so working with Rubes and then working with Hopi's really, like, expanded me. I've been in the industry almost, or almost this year, 20 years I've been in the industry, working, playing. And it's important to me. Like, I'm still learning every single day from both Rubes and Hopi and all the artists that we work with. Um, and that's what I really love about working with Ruby. Like, she teaches me so much every day about things about the industry that I had never thought about, never understood, never grasped, never, never, you know, experienced. So, yeah. What an answer. What an answer. That's me.
You always do better than me in that stuff. <laughs> like every like sappy Instagram post that we, not sappy, but like every like inspiring post that we have to post about, not have to, <laughs> that we post about our artists being like, oh my God, this release is so cute. He's always like, I'm I'm like, yeah, I fucking nailed that. And this dickhead like- All the score like, in the seven years ago. Yeah. Ever, and I'm like, fuck. <sighs> what a team. Love it. Uh, Rubes Hope, when you first started working together, were there any um, kind of like key steps that you felt you had to take first to really kind of, I mean, because it was just you two at the start, wasn't it? It was just, you know, tiny team. So what what did you do first? Um, it was it was really important to kind of like initially whenever we, whenever I take on a new artist and Dom does this too together now with me, um, but we kind of like plan out exactly what their goals are from like huge giant goals to really tiny ones um, and that kind of informs the plan really um, it was kind of we kind of had to follow a bit of a structure already because Hoki was in the middle of releasing um, an EP so we kind of had that to go for forward with and um, I think she already, you already can you had... share some of those goals with us play a beer inside a festival and <laughs> have your own beer one day. Have your own beer one day. Really centered around beer goals. Yeah, <laughs> beer and food goals for sure. Yeah. Um, and like playing Splendor and like amazing festivals and um, going to like interstate, international, like touring. Um, Hope you hadn't even done her first solo tour by the time we started working together. It was like she'd done, because it was COVID. She had done like a million outpost shows and sold them all out, but then we actually had like a legit Australian tour that went on forever. And you sold out like 18 shows for that tour across Australia. And it was amazing to see, like she had never done it before and I'd gone on tour with her and she was just like nailing it. Like it was actually insane. Um, so yeah, that, that was that. And then I guess, yeah, the first goal was like actually tour Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and, like, um, little things that's, like, really nice to have – to look back on and to have actually achieve, like, be played on the radio and, like, um, things like that. Little, uh, like, support a specific person. Um, and, yeah, it's really nice to look back on. It's really – it's so important to actually think about those things, like, every day and, like – because when you look back on you, yourself achieving them, it's, like, super magical. I think – and I just want to say that from our perspective, and I think, like, for artists and for managers, whoever's in the room – it's really important to have those goals and be able to like express them because it actually defines the kind of artist you want to be. So hope you wanted to tour internationally and play Splendor and play Falls, but there, you might be an artist and I've worked with artists who are like, I want to play house shows for the rest of our career. I don't care how many tickets we sell. I just want to make music, get it put on vinyl and play to my friends. And as a manager, that helps us go, okay, cool. I can see what the things that I can do here to help you achieve those goals. And it might also mean for us as managers, we go, I love that and I love your music, but I'm there is no point in me taking 20% of what you do, what you make, because you can do all that yourself. So with Hopi, like, obviously she had those lofty goals, but it's important, like, if you're a self-managed artist, which can I just actually get a show of hands? How many self-managed artists are here? Is it majority? Yeah. And so if you're a self-managed artist, write down those goals yourself. So it gives you like a direction to be able to go, these are the things that I actually need to achieve. Here are the steps to get to those goals. And then when you meet, you're at a point where someone like us goes, hey, let's work together. You're able to express, this is the artist I want to be because you're the boss, it's your business and it's your career. We just are here to help you achieve what you want to achieve. Sorry. No, great, love that, that's what you're here for. That's what you're getting paid for, don't I? So, um... <laughs> I'm getting paid? <laughs> <laughs> paid in snacks. Yeah. All right, so can you tell us about how, so this is directly directed more to you, Dom and Rubes, um, how you've seen Hope's career grow from when you started working with her. I remember I saw you, Hope, in 2017 in the front room at Rex oh. and you just had your acoustic guitar and now you've released your, you know, your debut album and you're on tour and you're playing these massive shows. Do you... Tell us about that. Love that. Yeah, no, insane. Well, I used to be a cover artist, actually, and that's how I made all my money. 
um, it, it pays so well. And it's, it was really good for me, like in so many ways. First of all, it was like paid practice because most of the time no one listens, which I love about that. Cause you just, I, that's actually how I like wrote a lot of my songs because I used to loop. So I'd lay down chords and then just start playing riffs over them and that's how like swim and like a lot of, my, like pretty much every song like came about. Um, but yeah, I used to love doing that for money and also, but then it got to a point where it was so soul sucking. And then when I, when I wanted to be managed by Ruby, Ruby said to me that um, if you want to do this and like, you know, be what you want to be, you can't do the cover gigs anymore. And it was so nice to hear that as well. And it was, I remember doing my last one and it was just like the biggest weight of being lifted off my shoulders. Nothing bad about doing cover gigs, it's amazing and it's so fun, especially when you interpret the songs yourself because that helps you grow as well. But um, for me, I'd, I'd done like sometimes six a week and I was just really grinding. And um, you know, all the songs had lost their meaning and I just wanted to play my own songs. So that's when I knew that it was definitely time to stop doing that. But um, yeah, I used to do, do those um, gigs at Rick's and um, you get paid like 50 bucks cash. <laughs> and <laughs> and <So cheap. laughs> I know, and um, me and my mate Nathan, we used to do them all the, like we used to hound the guy to book us every week. And then he'd be like, can you make a Facebook page to bring people in? And so we'd make a Facebook page and be like, la 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 as the title. And then the cover photo would be like a stock image of someone holding a guitar. And then we made an event, so you can't tell us that we didn't. Um, so 50 bucks, please. <laughs> and yeah, the goal was to not have anyone there. <laughs> but yeah, it's nice to, to want people there now. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, but yeah, it is insane to like go from that and to have a bunch of people not listening to you, um, like just in a bar or a cafe, to having people actually turn up for the songs that you wrote. That's, that's, that was the biggest thing for me. And to hear people, you know, it's, it's so amazing to hear people sing back to you when you play a cover. But hearing them play like a song that you wrote, like in your bedroom, that's quite insane. It's really nice. Dom and Rubes, how has it been for you guys seeing that evolution of Hope's career? It's been really cool. The first time I saw Hopey, um, it, she was playing a covers gig in a, in a burger place in the city. Um, and I walked in accidentally and she was there and she was like... <gasps> <laughs> and then I ended up like kind of sitting like right next to you. Yeah, right. And the whole time she was just like... <laughs> see this like, uh, but she like played a bug song and I was just like she, she really wants my attention right now um, but it was adorable um, we used to book the milk factory as well and Hopi like played it pretty much every month um, so we've seen her like been around her name and known who she was for a long time um, and it's been amazing like it's actually been insane the amount of stuff that she has done over COVID as well and just been able to like pull out releases and tours and like now touring with other people's bands and still like she played to thousands of people in Tasmania at a festival last weekend and then has gone straight into someone else's tour playing guitar um and it's just like incredible she's going south by southwest this year so going taking her internationally and it's I don't know it's just I, don't know, I kind of want to cry about it <laughs> it's like seeing my daughter like grow up to be you know, she deserves everything she gets because she's literally the nicest person in the entire world. Oh, that's really literally, sweet. nicest. Like, as someone that has really only come into like primarily being part of the Hope D journey in the last twelve months, maybe um, it's been really great to watch from the outside. Obviously, with Rubes, but I, like to me, Hope is the absolute like. I say this a lot, obviously I do a lot of key music workshops, I see a few familiar faces from those here as well and what I, I always say is you've got, to walk, you've got to walk before you can run but you've got to crawl before you can walk and hope to me is the epitome of why that is such a good thing to remember. Hope's been doing this, like if you speak to the media or to radio they'd say brand new emerging sensation, Hope T is just finally, it's like... She's been slogging it out for years. Hope T's been slogging it since, what, 2016, 2017, Hope T? Yeah. yeah that's and so that's like, that is now six years, um, six or seven years. But the thing is that Hope started small. She learnt her craft, she did the covers gigs. And then she built to smaller venues, started doing the milk factory every month. And then when, as Rubes say, you see her playing with her band, she now plays with a full band, and when you see her playing with in a full band in, in a major festival in Tasmania to thousands of people and just killing it, I immediately go, that's someone who knows their craft. She knows how to use the crowd, she knows when to pull it back, when to bring it foot, bring it up, when to like, you know, you know, bring us use the the dynamics of a song. And that's from what she's learned by 
slogging our guts out over years. But I want to also bounce off what Rube said. Like, hope is, I've worked with many artists as both an, an artist, self-managed artist, and I've never come across someone who is so grateful for everything that she achieves. And I probably am going to get emotional because I do that. That's quite but a lot. I do cry a lot. But <laughs> the point is to me is that, like, hope at every point of her career will stop and say, how cool is this? I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so fortunate. And there's a big difference between the artists that I've worked with who don't do that and the artists who do do that. The artists who don't do that get three or four years in and they go, language warning, fuck this, I'm out. I don't want to do this anymore, this sucks. Because they don't, they're not able to turn around and go, oh, like, look at all these amazing things that I've achieved in the last three to four years that I never thought I'd be able to achieve. And now I'm achieving more. And that's incredible. And we have a real problem, and I think it's an evolutionary thing in our brains as humans, to be like, you hit something and you go, okay, what's next? What's next? What, how can I get bigger? You know, or um, it's also, the, unfortunately, the... Um, capitalist system of, upon which we all live under, but I'm not going to go into my manifesto right now. You can you can look on my blog for that. But we, everything's like grow bigger, and it, it's it's part of what we have to do. But if you don't sit and appreciate the really great things you're doing, and also appreciate the fact that you are so fortunate to be able to do them at all, yeah. then you'll end up like a lot of unfortunately, like, sad and bitter and twisted musicians like me. <laughs> I could have beat something, man. Like, but appreciate what you have. And I think Hope is the best example of that. She, last weekend, she just kept saying, like, we're so lucky to be here. I'm so lucky to have these people around me. I'm so fortunate. I'm so lucky. Um, she said yeah. it about today, this morning. Yeah, Literally, absolutely. Whereas, you know, Gang of Youths had four bloody demountables and they were probably still complaining they didn't have five. <laughs> they had their own Wi-Fi network at the festival. So Gang of Youths Wi-Fi, I'm not kidding. But they're actually really nice people. I don't think they were complaining <laughs> yes, at all. Yeah, right. yeah. Did I answer a question he then? Just, or did I just, he just went create a new manifesto? Yeah, yeah, he answered yeah. a question really, really well. Bringing Hashtag it back. blessed is what I'm saying. <laughs> Bringing it back to, you know, the aspects of, of working as a team, um, tell us about how you discuss strategy day to, day, day to day. Is that something that, you know, that you as Sunroom takes on that hope you just provide ideas for and then they kind of take it and run or is it more collaborative? How does it work on a day to day basis? Yeah, I'd say that I like come up with ideas and whatnot and you guys like make it happen and like strategize it like really well. Um, to points that I can't, which is super awesome. And it feels really collaborative and you guys have amazing ideas because, you know, like my vision and, you know, everything that I enjoy and, like, want to do and stuff. So it's, it's like, a really good direction and, like, yeah, like, I know that you guys just talked about this, but that's so lucky to have you guys. It's been, like, the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, very grateful. And I think it's, like, very important to have, like, the right team because I do see, like, bands – I know this is going a bit off, but, like, bands that have um, managers that they don't really gel with or, like, I don't know, it's it's something that I've been seeing a lot recently, but, like, to have managers that are both, like, my best friends and my mum and dad, and it's, like, it's, it's, it's very lucky, and I feel like that just makes it so much easier to be in the direction that I want to be going in. We have a text thread as well, which is really handy, that we just, like, text all day, even if it's, like, pee-pee-poo-poo, -poo or, like, <laughs> just hope he's favourite thing to say. Um... <laughs> We just talk all day, every day, which is, yeah, it's how we get to know each other so well. Yeah. I think we, in this industry, have a lot of trouble with um, boundaries um, in terms of professional boundaries and times and that kind of thing. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the way that this industry is set up, those boundaries that a normal person would have is, are just not able to exist because you're dealing with someone who is creating art and doing creativity and it's not like you're dealing with someone who is making, you know, hammers or something and you're the hammer manager. Um, <laughs> you're dealing with someone that you're you're taking something that... And I, would, I was talking about this with one of our other artists this week, Asha Jeffries, because <laughs> she's about to sign a big worldwide deal and it's a 
and a label deal and she is entrusting her art to someone whose entire purpose is commerce. And what we really struggle with in this industry, I think, is that juxtaposition between art and commerce and having to combine them because we create art for love and because we are passionate about it. We don't create it to make money. If you do create it to make money, let's have a big chat because I've got some bad news for you. But, <laughs> but the long and the short of it is like we are in this industry, Rubes and I, primarily firstly because we love music but also because we love the people who make music and we love the people who love music. And we love Hobi like she's our own daughter, but she is one of our best friends. And that's probably not entirely healthy when it's a business relationship, but it also gives you some of the biggest highs and genuine amounts of love and feeling and, you know, that you can experience. And when you see someone that you love experiencing something great, it makes you feel great and it makes it all worth, worthwhile. And... Um, I've always counted myself as um, Ruby's a mumager, and um, I've always sort of, I'm kind of the stepdadager, <laughs> but um, she just called me dad. <laughs> so it's a real moment. We just witnessed something very special here. <laughs> uh, Hope, was it difficult to hand over the, some of the responsibility of the business side to someone that wasn't you? I think, like, at first it was a little bit, um, but when things started happening where I just, like, had no idea what I was doing, it was extremely easy. But obviously, because, uh, like, as artists, we're very precious about art, like, the last thing that you'd want is someone to change, like, you know, I, I'm sure people would have fears that, like, people on your team would want you to change specific words or lyrics or, like, sounds and whatnot, which is, like, totally fine for, like, suggestions and whatnot. But it would be really easy to take it personally and, like, you know, if they're trying to change it, to a terrible extent, then it's not really your art anymore. Um, but I think, like, it was, it, it got to the point where I was, like, super happy and comfortable with it. And, um, yeah, the tap-taps just got too much. And tap-taps is, like, when you go on your laptop and you tap away doing admin work and replying to emails and mm -hmm. looking up the closest restaurants and stuff. Um, so that was really... It was really good to hand over those aspects. And it's, like, really nice to hear, you, like, everything that you think of my art also. Um, yeah. I think um, just to add on to that, like Hopi has taken, we've taken a lot of responsibility out of Hopi's hands, but she's also across everything and can ask questions at any time. And I think that's really important for the self-managed artists when you get a manager. If they don't want to like be like lay everything out on the table and tell you everything that's going on while it's going on, that's a red flag. Because um, as much as it's like probably really um, appealing to be like, ah, I'm just going to make some songs and, like, go on tour and stuff. Like, I think it's really important for you to remain a, a really, um, in, like, imperative point into your business. You're the CEO of your own music and your own, like, your, this is a business at, at the end of the day when you want to make money from it, as much as that's gross. Um, so you still have to be, you know, across everything and Hopi is very much across everything that she wants to be. Yeah. Always remember you're the boss. Like, when it comes down to it, Hopi is our boss. Um, well, maybe I don't want to tell her that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's Hopi's business, and if we don't want to do something that she wants to do, well, too bad for us. We can give her the advice and say, well, this is the reason we don't think this is going to work or we think it should be done differently. But if Hope says, don't care, this is important to me, then it's also our philosophy, how we work. is And, and probably Rube's more than me, if I'm being honest, like being more like... Shut your mouth. This is what the artist wants. We're going to do it. I just love telling them to shut, shut Yeah, mouth. yeah. I say, good morning, Ruth. She says, shut your mouth. <laughs> um, and this is for all three of you because I think it'd be interesting to have, you know, a songwriter performer's perspective and the management perspective. Um, for the people here who want to start building their team, maybe they haven't yet, maybe they're starting to think about it, uh, what are some, what are the top crucial things that you think all artists should be thinking about before they start to build their team? I think, like for me, I think it's like more ideal and appealing if someone comes to you to want to work with you because that means that you, you like what I do and like you can like look out, you can reach out to managers and, art and like booking agents and whatnot, but I feel like the 
it's really authentic when someone approaches you because that's like you, you're going to gel well obviously and they have the same intentions in mind for you as they do kind of thing um so that was that was super important like I knew that you did like that bugs cover I did <laughs> it's all about the bugs cover yeah. it's really cinched it for me yeah but like having a star <laughs> yeah but yeah every time like I'd send you a song or, or something and your feedback and it like both of you it um it just it's like proof for me that it's like the definitely the right um, thing that we're doing, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I think it's really important to like take stock and just go, do I actually need this? Um, a lot of people get managers too early in their career and they're just paying 20% to someone for literally just doing tap taps um, when there's not enough like momentum or, you know, that kind of stuff to really do any strategic stuff, that which is what a manager does. So if they're kind of just being like, you know, oh, yeah, we'll organise this little local show, la, 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 you can do that all on your own. And I think you should. Um, it's imperative for you to know exactly what a manager does so then when you get a manager, you can check up on them and be like, hey, that's not right, I feel weird about that. Because there's a lot of people out there that will approach you and they just want to take advantage. There's, it's like the way of the business, it's gross, it's yuck. I think it's getting way better. Um, because the gross people seem to get weeded out by getting called out on the internet pretty easily. But, um, it, yeah, there's still people out there that just want to take money just for the sake of it and when you can literally do it yourself. Yeah, and then to jump off that point, there are people that want to take advantage, but I think there are a lot of people that look at music and go, that looks fun. I want to have fun. I want to have a really good time. But it's like what Ruby and I do is really fun, but it's also really hard work. We are like taking someone's business and art in our hands and trying to raise the profile of it to be able to really, in the end, create a sustainable long-term career for them. That's our goal. So, you know, remember that sometimes someone might seem really great and really awesome, a friend or a you know family member or someone you meet at a gig, and they might say, hey, I've never managed anyone before, but I'd love to manage you. And that might be okay. People have done that and then ended up having massively successful careers in music. That was Paul Petico, who now runs Secret Sounds and um, Splendor. He was Powderfinger's manager and he was literally a mate of theirs from school. And like that, so that does happen, but you've just got to be wary. And I think exactly what Rube said and exactly what Hopi said use the time as a self managed artist to learn your trade. You can come to QUT. Oh, what a great place. I love it. I hate JMC. No, I'm joking. Um, you can go to QUT. You can go to JMC. You can go to TAFE and do music business. That's what I did. And you can learn, like, the very basic things about the music industry. But you'll walk out of there going, okay, now what? It's We don't have the same kind of educational system in this industry that you might if you're an engineer or an architect or a doctor or whatever. The way we learn is going out and doing it, making mistakes or kicking goals and being like, ah, okay, cool, I get it now. And so use the time when you are a self-managed artist or you are someone starting out or doing it yourself, use that time and enjoy that time to learn and so that you know when two um, unscrupulous shysters like Ruby Jean and I knock on your door... Um, <laughs> No, we're good people, sorry. Um, and say, hey, kid, we want to manage you. You know, like, um, you know whether or not they're doing the right things. So I think that's really important. And, you know, you're the boss, so you need to be able to say yes or no. Bouncing off that, Domo, if, if, an, if an artist, you know, anyone in this, in this room doesn't have a team yet, are there things that you think they should be prioritising before they start building a team? Uh, yeah, your music, your songs, because nothing matters except that. Um, Rubes and I always will see great artists, you know, their names popping up again and again in front of us, and the first thing we will do is go and listen to them, and we go, oh, songs are okay. Like, they look cool, they're playing great shows, they must be good live because they're getting lots of gigs, but the songs aren't there yet. And the song is everything. It doesn't matter what you look like, 
you know, like it doesn't matter like how you're dressed. It doesn't really even matter how good your live show is, even though that is very important. If your songs aren't good, then it doesn't matter. And in the end, the songs are all that that matter. So that's what I would say is like focus on that. If you're a songwriter or you're a member of a band that is is wanting to, I mean, I'm guessing most of these people are songwriters seeing this is an upper event, but you know, focus on getting the songs right first because everything else will follow. Because a great song is going to be a great song forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, logistics and things like that. Do you guys have contracts in place? Yes, I do. I think ours has actually run out with Hopi. Yeah. Whoops. We've got to sign a new one. <laughs> Well, we've also just formed a new company. So we were formerly two sole traders working independently and now that we've just formed a company, so we'll have to actually... We're directors. Yeah, and that's right. Lights, camera, action. That's my eyebrows to raise. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've got to sign in a new one with Hopi. So right now, if there's anyone out there who wants to snap her up, technically she's not under contract. So got no, the, first, the contract does say it continues until someone wants to not get it. Anyway, sorry, let's get... Yes, there, we do. <laughs> are there any kind of red flags that people should be looking out for? You know, if they're perhaps signing with a manager for the first time, you know, kind of hope, hope you haven't been stung by anything. Oh, what? why are you thinking about it? <laughs> it says pre sunroom. <laughs> no, oh no, pre sunroom. Pre -sun oh my god, pre sunroom. <laughs> um, yeah, I got approached with like a contract a couple times and. <laughs> There's just so many words. I had no idea what it was saying. And, like, I um, took it to some lawyers and stuff. I ended up getting really screwed over by this lawyer who actually, like, fully ghosted me and, like, left the country. It was so weird. <laughs> yeah, it was... Oh, God, it was, so it, was a, it was a weird time in my life, I'll tell you that. Um, but the red flags were that I didn't have... Um, didn't have someone to, like, read it, I guess, and, like, sign with it. And, and, and for this one, like, this contract this management contract, not you guys, um, didn't feel right. And that was a massive red flag. It's like you're signing away. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, contracts are so scary. Uh, they, they should be taken seriously. Should they? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, just, I think it's just good that hope you trust her gut, really. I think that's a great, like, moniker of what you should be doing as well. And going to a lawyer, maybe one that doesn't ghost you. That's yeah. really freaking weird. Um, <laughs> But yeah, any contracts that you're kind of presented with, go to the lawyer straight away. Um, Arts Law Queensland is that mm -hmm. has um, a really good resources, and you can sign up. I think it's like sixty bucks or something. It's some kind of amount of money for a year, and you get like a couple of free, you know, um, sessions with a lawyer there. Um, so you can always like get them. To, I've done it before with my bands. Um, get them to kind of check over a contract. It's good, especially if you have like limited money. Um, and then I think you get like one more, you can do two sessions, I think. But anyway, Arts Law Queensland, look it up if you have a contract. It's not expensive and it's way cheaper than actually hiring a, a lawyer. And they're actually really amazing lawyers too. Um, which they, what's the, they don't donate their time to, it's not like. Pro bono. Pro bono, that's it. Um, so anyway, um, trust your gut, read as much as you can, ask questions to other musicians if you want to, you know, kind of get a collaborative idea of what's going on but really get a lawyer to look at it i think uh there's some pretty standard things that come in a management contract um which is usually 20 percent um some managers ask for 25 percent but that's like your john watson paul patico danny rogers the, the the guys who guys and, and ladies too who have been to the highest levels you know like Gautier's manager is Danny Rogers. I think he asked for 25%. So you kind of go, all right, maybe it's worth it, you know, because of connections that he might have. Um, but 20% is standard. Um, usually uh, it will have a uh, anywhere up to five years um, time frame, sometimes down to three years clause. They should never have any of your commission or percentage or royalties in perpetuity it should always just be in the term of that contract except there is a thing called a sunset clause which is if you finish working with someone over the next usually it's somewhere between three to five years the manager will get a 
a smaller percentage every year of things that they worked on. So if they worked on an album, they might in the first year of not working together get 15%, then 10%, blah, blah, blah. And that's just to recognise the fact that the work that that manager put in because they only get commission. That's the other thing I want to say. It's only commission. There will be managers out there who will tell you they need a flat fee per month and that's fine. They can ask for that, but you can also say no. If they want to sign you badly enough, they will sign you for a commission fee because it's about investing in your career, right? And if they don't like that, cool, go get a job where you get paid a wage. The other thing I will say as well is always ask for a trial period. We automatically put into our contract so we have a six month trial period. And to be totally honest with you, that's to protect us as it is as much to protect the artist. Because if our values aren't aligned, if our goals aren't aligned, we will know that within usually a couple of months. But six months gives it enough time that we might be able to sit there and go, you know what, I think you're great, but we're just not the right managers for you or vice versa. So that's really important as well. And I want to like reiterate what Rube said because it's really important. Ask your peers, ask everyone in this room, hey, have you heard of this person? Have you worked with them before? Call like call other like managers you might know. Email Ruby and I like... The, when I started out, I've been the person sitting in this these chairs in this room before. Same. And when I started out, managers that I um, respected, which obviously I am not one, but um, there are other managers you probably respect. Um, <laughs> that was I'm going for a joke, but you all just stayed silent, so it felt <laughs> really pathetic. Um, but um, uh, like. I reached out to them and they helped me and they would have a 15-minute coffee or a 30-minute coffee. Josh, I know we owe you one. Um, um, that, that to say, hey, well, have you think, thought about this? Or it might be a thing of going, hey, here's my contract. Would you mind having a quick look at it? And a manager will usually within, what, 10, 15 minutes be able to go, no, nah, this is dog shit or whatever. Um, that's not an official industry term, dog shit. That's... A, um, <laughs> other term but um they're not recording this are they um but yeah well that's how you everyone lifts each other up you know the rising tide lifts all boats and if everyone helps each other we don't have a lot of collective bargaining power as artists and as an industry because everyone just works for themselves but what we can do is we can help each other up we can lift each other up and that will lift everyone else and it will give everyone else the knowledge and expertise they need to be able to succeed. Um, for the artists in this room who maybe haven't got any any team yet, um, do you have any advice for people wanting to reach out to other members of the team, management, booking agents, PR, you know, all that kind of stuff? Sound techs, producers. Be specific. Do your research. Don't just like shoot from the hip and ask everyone because we all know each other and people will, will realise and be like, oh, they're just, they're not actually wanting to work with me, they just want to work with someone. Um, so, yeah, do your research, look at other artists that you might, you know, kind of admire or <gasps> want to, like, follow their career path and see who they're working with. Um, but, yeah, be specific and don't just, you know, willy-nilly do it because it's not going to get you good results anyway. <laughs> and we'll know. Uh, <laughs> I hate when she does the whispering thing. Um, I've got two things. One thing is to remember that no one cares about your music as much as you do. And um, that's something that's, I mean, we care about Hope's music. Well, no, we don't. Um, but that's something to remember, especially now if you are looking for a team, but even continuing throughout your career because it is your music and you should care about it more than everyone else. So that's the first thing to remember. But it's also important to remember that when you go to people. No one cares about your music more than you right now. So remember that the passion and, and love that you had for it, others may not share. And that's okay. That's, uh, that's allowed. The other thing is be really respectful of people's time and expertise. So, you know, remember that Ruby and I are getting, what, 70 to 100 emails in our inbox every day. We're getting phone calls. <laughs> yeah, don't remind us. 
you're getting we're getting phone calls we're getting we've got meetings unfortunately we hate meetings but um except if it's with a local artist who needs some help <laughs> um, um thank you um um but so be respectful of time but the other thing was expertise if someone is you ask a question and someone gives you an answer listen to the answer there is actually nothing more that i hate in a circumstance where someone asks me a question where you start answering it and they go yeah i know that yeah i know that yeah i know that and you're like cool well go away because like you don't need me right but it's important to listen to what someone is telling you you might feel that you know it but don't jump the gun because people are actually trying to tell you something that you should probably be focusing on. If you're asking a certain question of Ruby or I or Hope or Mono, if you feel like you know the answer they're already telling you, well, think about why that might be and why we are still telling you that thing. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah. Hope you have anything to yeah. add? I completely agree. I think just like, um, like just keeping up the passion and showing people how passionate you are. I think that's like very like attractive when you want to try and find a team and those things should feel like very correct if you're still like being yourself and being passionate and that's like your main thing. The main thing should always yeah be the music and not changing because you want a certain person to pay attention or anything like that. Amazing. I think we're going to open up to some questions now. So are there any questions? Um, I, uh, I suppose I'm curious about uh, how your roles differ for, for management. Like, you were talking about strengths and weaknesses, like, initially. Um, yeah, what are you... Uh, why is that two people? <laughs> <laughs> What's with the two people? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to take this one, Dominic? Sure. Um, there's two people um, because the way that we work anyway, we are very collaborative. And I don't think everyone necessarily works well that way. Um, but I'm, I mean, in every part of my life, I'm always saying to people, what do you think about this thing that I'm doing? You know, you know, it's just who I am. But I think as well, like, we work really well together. Um, and we work really collaboratively. I think it also allows us to cover more ground. We are, we get very, we get extremely passionate about music that we love. And we are both like, I will walk across hot coals to work with that artist because I love their music so much and I love them so much. And it allows us to be able... So we manage five active bands and two inactive bands because we also are sort of business managers continuing for two bands, Good Boy and Sweater Coast. We continue to manage their businesses for them, their merch stuff and their streaming and manage their catalogue. Um, so it allows us to do that and be able to work across all the artists because we love all our artists. I think we also sort of, in um, I guess unofficially, uh, you've asked a question that we probably are also still working through live a little bit, where we kind of take the lead on an artist a little bit. And it's just naturally, I think, one of us will naturally take the lead on an artist and the other is there to, like, do the work and get things done. Um, but also like co-manage and, and assist the other person in, in things that they need done. Yeah, and we've also got uh, like business-wise, um, structurally, I usually do a lot of the stuff that's on ground with artists. I go on tour with them. I do a lot of, um, what's the word? Logistics. Logistics, booking flights, booking ground transport, accommodation, making sure they're all like okay and, and comfortable. Um, so I do a lot of kind of stuff that's directly with working with the artists in a live perspective or, um, I don't know, having them cry on my shoulder, et cetera, et cetera. Not that Dom doesn't do that, but um, Dom... But I also cry, so it's <laughs> yeah. a bit... When there's two people crying on each other's shoulders, it gets a bit... Um, but he just cries, yeah. Um, and Dom's more of the kind of, like, he takes care of a lot of the financials for the business, he takes care of a lot of the contracting. He's very, um, I'm not good with money um, <laughs> or numbers. So he's more of, like, that right brain type of guy. I guess right brain and left brain in a way. Um, and Dom's also, like, mm, I'm, he's more of an adult than I. So 
I have more freedom to be able to go on tour for a, a period of time, whereas Dom has more responsibilities and stuff like that. So, yeah, and I think like we then also are able to collaborate on the bigger stuff. So like it allows us to split the day to day boring stuff down. But then we're able to go, hey, let's talk strategy together and sit in a room together and be like, what does this artist need and want and blah, blah, blah. Um, two brains are better than one. Yeah, okay. totally. <laughs> and we're not like charging Kofi double because there's two people. It's still not. the generic <laughs> 20%. So it's she's getting double the person for the same amount of money. Yeah, and I know this has been a really long answer to a very short question, but we also do event stuff. So this is another really important point to make is like, your music business, unfortunately, doesn't just work usually on one income stream. It needs to work on multiple. So another income stream for us is event programming. So we co-program big sound showcases every year. And then we also do all the gallery of modern art up late stuff. And that is fully collaborative. So we work together really like, totally collaborative on that. So that's another reason why I guess we it's just easier. And... Final thing, talking of boundaries, it means that, like, for example, later this year, like, I'm getting married, sure. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Pause for applause. Um, but I'll be going on my honeymoon, and it means that I can know that for that period of time, Rubes can be like, okay, you just enjoy your honeymoon. She doesn't know this yet, but I'm going for two months. No. Um, <laughs> But you just go and enjoy yourself and vice versa. Like if I was ever to get sick and, you know, like have COVID or something and, and knock me about for a week or whatever, um, then I know that Rubes is there just to take care of everything. So it's good for boundaries and, and having a good work-life balance. What is that anyway? <laughs> <laughs> have we got any other questions? Yeah, sort of just adding on to that, how do you go with the difficulties that you face and like overcoming them, obviously managing so many projects, like, you know, to say post album and tour and that at the same time as Ash's label deal as well as all of the music stuff you want to grow up. Like, it's a lot on your plate. As well as a void single yesterday. I, what did, no. <laughs> I did the plan. I, last year I planned at the same time. On Will, like, didn't know. It just happened three tours at the same time and I was like literally flying from tour to tour being like, ah, oh, is that okay? <laughs> um, but that was my own dumb fault. Um, well, it's precisely why we're quitting key music, um, because we don't have the time to have full two full-time jobs, and we are literally, at the moment, just like, oh, burnt. Um, so we're, yeah, we've kind of recognised that that's not really smart anymore, um, and we're luckily enough to be able to support ourselves financially in our own business. Um, but yeah, it's a lot. I'm not gonna. Well, I'm not gonna lie. Like I have, I have breakdowns at least like once a month. But that's fine. Um, Domo cries most days, but um, mostly they're happy tears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy hungry He's... tears. Happy tears. Uh, tears are coming from all sorts of reasons. Legit. Um, so yeah, it's tough. It's it's tough. Yeah, we were. I mean, you know, to go back to the key music thing, because in the next section I'm actually going to have my key music hat on, not necessarily my sunroom hat, but we were very lucky when COVID hit, we had been working for a live agency and we were very lucky to suddenly be working for key music and have a job over COVID. So everything really slowed down for us sunroom wise, um, but obviously sped up for us key music wise. And now the world has come back and suddenly everything is speeding up for us sunroom wires and cue music is staying at the same rate so um it's yeah i mean we have been very lucky and very fortunate um but it's just you've you've got to look after yourself and as someone as i said like 20 years in this industry like the people that i started out with in the industry most of them are gone now and i don't mean dead um <laughs> uh, <laughs> um that they got burnt out and they left. They wanted to have families and buy houses and, you know, like live a normal life. Um, but they, and, and they couldn't do that and also balance music and live working in music. And that's artists as well, I will say. Like that's a lot of artists, that's a lot of industry. And I have friends of mine, so I'm, I'm 37 in a few weeks, and I have friends of mine that say, 
like, oh, you don't spend all your time with people in their 20s. And I'm like, yeah, that's because everyone else left except this sole loser <laughs> being like, yeah, it's gone, yeah. Oh, no, I remember when there were pretty much only three venues in Brisbane, actually, and... Um, Boy, oh boy, you young kids have it lucky these days. Uh, you can get in any mosh pit in town you want. Um, but, um, um, yeah, but you've got to look after yourself because, and I think I always tried to prioritise that. Like, I've always tried to prioritise having work-life balance, setting boundaries, you know, as, as much as possible. Um, but also... I suck at it. Yeah, I, I suck at it too. I, th I, I suck at it too, but the, I can't work anywhere else. I literally don't have the qualifications. <laughs> but also, like, I can't, I couldn't. Like, I just love this too much. I love working with people like Hope and, of course, love working with people like Ruby and Mono and, like, all of you. Like, this is, this is these are my people, you know? Like, so, like, I couldn't go anywhere else. God, shut up, <laughs> me. <laughs> We probably have time for one more question. Is there one more? Whoa. Oh, there's three. Dom, Dom can just like do speed round yeah. instead of. Talking. Yeah, and right, here's I'll the thing. Say. No. <laughs> we'll do speed round, speed round questions. All right. Three questions, ask them all at the same time. <laughs> um, just on the topic of like expanding the team, would you guys be looking to get like a booking agent before getting a manager? Or is there some sort of way that you would? about it like obviously you want like people to approach you and all that but should you be reaching out to booking agents to try and get more work to obviously get on like a manager's radar or something like that i mean hopey kind of did that straight yeah um you want to talk about hopey yeah that was really good i think because at that point too i still wanted to like do all my management stuff myself all my own tap taps and like playing my like music and strategies and stuff so to have like a booking agent to um give me like these gigs that were getting bigger audiences and stuff like supports and I think I went to Sydney um, once for King Street King Street Coral yeah like um that was my first interstate show and that was because of a booking agent um, to get me on that lineup which you know yeah opens you up to more audiences experiences and therefore like yeah being on managers radars I think that was really good like yeah I think I think that was like a really good way for me but that also just happened by chance mm, yeah I guess there's no no right answer. Yeah. Um, it depends on where you're at, really. It's so many variables. You could genuinely, like, manage yourself forever mm. and just have the rest of the team around you. I mean, a lot of artists do that. Cub sport. Um, it's literally the only thing that people I can think of right now. But there's a lot of artists out there that do that because they're just like, well, why? Um, this is my full-time job. I don't want to give my money to anyone else and we can just do it all ourselves. So, yeah, there's no real right or wrong answer. I'm going to keep it quick. Sorry to be, like, annoying. That's such an annoying answer. Uh, I will just say an agent, you do not sign a contract with an agent. It is a, you know, handshake deal. You just agree to work with them. You give them 10%. In Australia. In Australia. Um, uh, so, yeah. So that's a good thing. So you can always sign with an agent, and if it doesn't go well, six months be like, see ya. Um, and if you get a manager and the manager's like, I hate that guy, yeah, then you can go somewhere else. Yeah. Was there a question here? I just wanted to ask if, um, and Ruby, Dom, do you know any um, part-time musicians that have managers or is it only a full-time musician that would justify that? Because you know, someone might be transitioning from a day job to a mm. music career, so have, you have to do that. Yeah. Oh, Hopi still has a day job. Yeah. Like, she's a full-time musician, but she's still yeah. very... A lot of musicians have full-on day jobs yeah. as well. So I guess it depends on what you are doing within your career that you might need to kind of... It comes back to, I guess, will you, do you need to have someone taking care of your business because you're too busy with your art is basically kind of where it comes down to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Me. Uh, and there are definitely managers out there who just operate more as business managers for artists. So, you know, they let's say an artist is really big in the streaming world, you know, like and but doesn't play live very often or, or you know, whatever. A manager can just be there to run your catalogue and do that kind of thing. So 100%. But I think that Rube's answer is the right one. Like, what is a full-time musician? Like, not many of them exist in Australia. Um, only the really... And I'm, I'm talking, like, bands that are still playing, like, 
like probably Tivoli size venues, Trifford. So, I mean, he, I hope he's going to play the Trifford and probably sell it out. Um, no pressure. Um, <laughs> you know, like, and the, it almost doesn't exist, you know. So the answer is yes, but I understand what you're saying in terms of, like, part-time. Um, the answer is there. there is... Anyone can have a manager, you know. There just needs to be, I guess, the passion and the ability for a manager to, to take an income usually out of it. So there needs to be some kind of income stream. Yeah. All right, last question. Um, I just wanted to know what were the conversations you guys were having um, when Hope was like, I want to do an album? And like a lot of people say, like, album sounds like a vibe or like it was epic yeah. or like one day music, or was it like a he's more than up and coming artist now and she's been in it for a while, like she's ready to like yeah. Your cousin made a funny noise. <laughs> I think, well, um, like, I like I have, like, a massive backlog of songs and I've always wanted to record them all. Um, but then I released an EP in 2021 and then I was fortunate enough to win the Carol Lloyd grant and then that gives you um, 15 grand to either record an EP and tour it or record an album. And I was like, well, I've just done an EP. I, I guess I have to do the album. Um, so that's how that kind of came about and I was so lucky to get that, um, to be able to do it. Um, that kind of just answered that question. Like, that, it was definitely time for me too, and I really wanted to make, like, a collection of songs. Um, but I totally understand. I know, like, a lot of artists don't want to release albums because our attention spam is so terrible because of TikTok and social media. I can't even read anymore. <laughs> it's so bad. Legit. Yeah, I can't. Oh, it's just TV shows and Netflix for me now. But, um, yeah, but, like, you know, I, it, like, either way is totally fine. Like, if you just release singles or EPs and, and stuff, um, people listen to whatever they want to listen to, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends, I guess, on your what you're writing. Um, we've encouraged people to, like, luckily, not luckily, but because you're amazing, but um, Hopi's had a, an amazing catalogue of music and we kind of saw it all together and we're like, hell yeah, you're, you're going to do an album, my dog. Um, and it was awesome that we got the catalogue grant to help with that. But um, there are points in, a, in other people's careers that we've said, hey, this collection of songs that you want to mush together isn't really something that you should be doing. It might just be a waste of money. So we go, why don't we do an EP and you, we do like the most, the greatest songs out of it. So it really depends on what you're writing and um, where you're feeling. I feel like at, you, you'll, ne you'll only ever have one debut album. So it's a moment um, specifically within the industry. I know that we kind of run off of singles, like commerce of singles. Um, and singles at King because of exactly what Hopi was saying, but you'll only have one debut album, so you want to really make sure that you're like ready to go and it's got you, you can't waste it basically. So that's kind of an answer as well, I guess, if you want to. Yeah. yeah, it's a real statement within the industry to release an album, and um, the importance of the album is getting less and less to the public. Um, so, you know. You know, it did, yeah, um, I'll echo what everyone said there as well. Um, I, I think the really important thing is you might have enough songs for an album, but that doesn't mean you should release an album. Um, it costs a lot of money, usually. Um, it costs a lot of time, a lot of energy, um, and you are better off getting to the point where you're getting your first shot at a debut album, you know. Um, but if you're like a pop artist or an electronic artist, like those worlds don't really care about albums. Um, but I think everyone in this room probably cares about albums. <laughs> and to come back to the point, it's about your art and it's about your creativity. And it's probably important to you to release a body of work as an artist. But there are strategies to make both work. Be releasing lots of singles and still release an album and make both work and it's just about the strategy that you you form around can it. Can I add one quick, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry to be a dom about this, but um, oh. we had recent, like uh, we manage a band called Void and they've been sitting on their album for a little while, not that long in the grand scheme of things, but they're like, we need to get this out, I just can't, I just need these songs out straight away. And we're like, we've been trying to chill them out for a while and they are, they've only just started kind of releasing singles from the album but 
um, that you'll probably feel that too, like the need to get something out. And I'm sure, and hope he has felt this exact kind of feeling. But there's points where you just got to go, wait a minute, is this strategically the right point for me to release, or am I just wanting to get my songs out because I just want to release them out? And sometimes it's just like not the thing to do. And um, waiting, kind of, we've made Void wait like another six months before we even started releasing, but it's kind of, it's worked exactly the way we wanted to because it would just would have been a waste, you know. Um, so there's that also that you have to battle against yourself to just want to get something out, but just chill maybe sometimes and just kind of take stock of what, where you are in your career. Yeah. And I think, again, that depends on the kind of artist you are, isn't it, too? If you're like a full DIY punk artist, well, fucking record the songs and put them out in two weeks on Bandcamp only. Who cares? Like, that's where your audience is. So do that. But if you are a, for example, with Asha, we're about to sign this deal. We had a, we had a meeting with the head of the label in Canada yesterday, um, which was quite intimidating, fucking fat cat city. Um, but um, this is not being recorded, is it? This is... That's our video. Oh, dude, right okay. There. Edit that part out, please. Um, I was talking about myself. Uh, the guy from Canada was just super down to earth. He actually was really nice. But he was really nice. Yeah, no, but it was like a little bit intimidating. Um, but like, Asha wants her music out tomorrow and they were like, cool, so when do you think you'll be able to have the final album delivered to us? Masters, artwork, etc." And we said, oh, 1st of May. And they were like, cool, all right, so we're probably looking at like a May, June, July 2024 album release date. And the terror that came into Asha's <laughs> eyes of like, yep, <laughs> yep, sounds great to wait over a year until this album that I so want the world to hear is out. But when we then went through, hey, Asha, here's all the things that we will need by the 1st of May, she was like, do you reckon we could push that date back a little bit? Or, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's um, important <laughs> to wait sometimes. I couldn't think of that in summary. Nailed it. All right, that's probably where we're going to leave it uh, before the... For the lunch break. So everyone join me in thanking Hope, Groups and Dom. Um, and and Mono too. Big thanks to Mono. I will just say as well that uh, we're lucky enough to have Hope be curating our 321 sessions in April, um, which all of you lovely RSVPs will get an invite to apply to. Um, so if you're interested in doing a cool songwriting session curated by Hope, then feel free to apply for that. It'll be at 4000 Studios in, in the Valley, which, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, stay tuned for the afternoon round tables. And yeah, we've got people from Gyro Stream and 4 Z and the team staying on as well. Um, so yeah, we've got some snacks out in the kitchen. We'll see you in an hour. One forty. One forty. Let's do one forty.